Well, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see you all and see so many people I know and getting to know through these groups people I haven't met before. It feels such a privilege. But before I start the talk, I would like to start with the homage and then the refugees and precepts and then the Metta Sutta. Araham, Sama, Sambudo, Bhagawa, Budam, Bhagawantam, Abiwademi, Svakato, Bhagawata, Damo, Daman, Namasami, Supatipano, Bhagawato, Sawaka, Sango, Sangam, Namami. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Bhutang saranaṅga chāmi Tamang Sarananga Chami Sanghang Sarananga Chami Dutiampi Butang Sarananga Chami Dutiampi Damang Sarananga Chami Dutiampi Sanghang Sarananga Chami Tatiampi Bhutang Sarananga Chami Tatiampi Dhammang Sarananga Chami Tatiampi Sanghang Sarananga Chami Panati Pata Viramani Sikapadang Samadhi Ami Adinadana Viramani Sikapadang Samadhi Ami Kame Sumi Chachara Viramani Sikapadang Samadhi Ami Musawada Viramani Sikapadang Samadhi Ami Sura Meriyamacha Pamadatana Viramani Sikapadang Samadhi Ami Yasa Nupa Watoyaka Newa Das Tenti Bing Sanam Yam Hiche Wanu Yunjanto Ratindi Wamatandi To Sukam Supati Soto Japa Pam Kinchi Napasati Ewa Madi Gunope Tang Paritang Tang Banamahe Karani Yamata Kusalena Yang Tang Sang Tang Padang Abisa Mecha Sako Uju Chasu Huju Chasu Acho Chasa Mudu Anatimani Santu Sako Chasu Baro Chaa Pakecho Chasala Huka Wutti Sam Tin Rio Chanipako Chaa Pagapo Gulesu Anan Hugid Ho Nachakudam Samachare Kinchiye Na Winyu Pare Upawadeum Sukino Wake Mino Hom to Sabbe Sata Bawam to Sukitata Yeke Chipam Nabuta Tita Sawa Tawarawa Anawa Se Sabdik Hawaii Mahantawa Majima Rasaka Anukatulpa Ditawa Yecha Adit Ye chadure was samti awi dure, Utawa samba we siwa, Sabbe satta bawam to sukitata, 
naparo param niku beta nati mam yeta kata chinam kin chibiaro sana patiga sanya nanya manya sadu kam ichea mata yatani yang putang ayusa e kaputam anurake e wam pisababute sumana sam bawaye aparimanha metang chasabalo kasmin mana sam bawaye aparimanha udam abdo chatiriam cha asambadham awerang asapatam Titan charam nisin noa, Sayan noa ya watasa we got a meat ho, Etam satim adite ha, Ram ha etang we harang idamahu, Dit incha anupagam masila wadas and nena, Sampam no kame suine a gate Nahi jap to gaba sayang punare tea. Okay, um, the title of this is Using Story in Samatha, and I'm aware that in the context of the talks we've had so far, this may seem a little off piste, but despite appearances. Using story as part of Dhamma is more than light entertainment. It's something that can complement and enhance other forms of studying and investigating Dhamma. I was a storyteller for many years before I discovered Samatha and then embraced Buddhism. And these are the two of the most important strands in my life. And they've both had an enormous impact on me. I've tended until fairly recently to keep the two strands separate. But in the last few years, I've been thinking more about how I could combine them to deepen my practice. So these are some of the ideas I want to share. To start, I want to make it sh clear what I'm not talking about. I'm not going to talk about our own personal story, as in our own personal interior narrative which can direct our lives and which we can change. We're all aware that we can create our own stories of our lives, of ourselves. We all construct our own narratives to explain how and what we believe. But I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about story as, this is the Collins Dictionary definition, an account of imaginary events or people told for entertainment and of how we can use it to investigate all aspects of Dhamma. Just as the Buddha did when he used the suttas and the Jataka tales to teach. As humans, we're storytelling animals and we use story to make sense of and to investigate our world, to make sense of how we think and live. Because stories bypass the logical, analytical mind. And they reach places sometimes faster than investigation alone. So in the suttas, who can't bring to mind the vivid image of the first and then the second dart striking the body? Or the image of the raft sailing over the river on the raft and then deciding whether to carry it or not? Most of us have never been struck by darts physically or sailed rafts or had to decide whether to carry them. But we can all visualize this. Story creates images and associations which we internalize and this strengthens the message for good or for bad. And either way, this process is very powerful. The Buddha realized the power of stories as shown in the Jatakas. And I'm sure that many of you, or most of you, have come across them. But for those of you, those of you who haven't, the Jatakas, the birth stories of the Bodhisattva, are perhaps the longest and oldest collection of folk tales in the world. 
originally from India, these 547 stories blended in with the teaching of the Buddha and in time became part of the Buddha teachings. The hero in each story, whether animal or human, came to be seen as the Buddha in a former life, working his way towards enlightenment. These are teaching stories, fables, and they focus strongly on two major themes which are central to our Theravada traditions. A deep compassion, compassion for life and karma. We do use story in Samatha, but maybe we could use it more as part of normal Dhamma discussions, sessions, rather than an add-on. I wonder how often do we introduce our Dhamma investigation sessions with one of the Jataka tales? Though I know we do run Sutta groups. Sometimes introducing a topic through stories frees us up to discuss our own experience more easily. This is something I found working with children in schools and among teachers and in community groups. Story gives us a way in to discussing something we're sometimes a bit hesitant about sharing our own experience. And I'd like to direct your attention to two resources from Samatha, both courtesy of Sarah Shaw, a Samatha teacher we all know. The first one is in the Penguin Classics series, and you can find her translation of an introduction to 26 of the best known Jataka stories. And then we have a more recent edition, the online Samatha at Home magazine. And it's produced, I think, weekly by the Southern Centre in Milton Keynes in response to the current crisis. And it includes articles, illustrations and poems. And if you haven't looked through it, you know, I do urge you to. But the highlight for me of this magazine is that for the first 10 issues, there was a retelling of a Jataka story. Um, they're read by Sarah and with animated illustrations by Guy Healy. And each story in this series was linked to one of the 10 perfections and illustrates very clearly how story can be used for Dhamma and how it could be used in a group as a basis for discussion. And I'd like to share one with you now. So make yourselves comfortable and get ready to listen to and to watch the retelling of the story of the quail. Once upon a time, the Bodhisattva was born as a quail. He grew in a shell and then when the time was right, he pecked his way out and emerged. He grew to be quite big for a quail actually. He was as big as a boar. And his parents used to come and bring him food so that he could grow well. But he still wasn't strong. He couldn't walk and he couldn't fly. So every day he just used to wait for his parents to bring his food and was happy in his tree just listening to the other birds and being part of the surroundings. Now, unfortunately, in that forest where his tree was, there used to be a lot of forest fires. And every year fire used to devastate all the trees around and the birds just used to have to flap and squawk and fly away and escape. So although he lived very happily, one day a forest fire did come near his tree and all the birds did flap and squawk and fly away. And unfortunately for the quail, so did his parents. His mother and his father became so frightened they just flew off and left him. So there he was in the nest, all on his own. And he looked around and he saw the fire coming and he realised there was nothing really he could do. Because he couldn't yet walk and he couldn't yet fly. All he could do was just sit in his nest. So he reflected to himself as he saw the fire coming and he thought, I've been abandoned by my parents. I'm completely alone in the world. 
What truth can I find? What is there that is really true? And he thought about it deeply. And then he realized, truth is true. There are beings called Buddhas in the world and they can practice meditation and find themselves free in their mind. They can be compassionate, they're just, they're kind to other beings. That's what's true. That's what's really true. Those, those qualities like good behaviour, love and kindness, wisdom, those are the real truths and they're the only ones I really know because I'm just a little quail in a nest and I can't know anything else. So what shall I do in my current situation? The only thing I can do is make a statement of truth. Now in ancient India, and I think all the animals knew this too, if you said something that was true, the universe listened. And so occasionally people performed great feats simply by stating what was true. And by the miracle of this quality of simple, straightforward truthfulness, what they wanted would happen. So the quail thinks to himself and he says, right, I'm going to make this statement of truth because I do know it is. It is right, it is true. There is compassion. There is justice, there is meditation, there is good behaviour. By these truths, I make this statement of truth, that there is Dhamma, there is teaching in the world. There is a way to the end of suffering. And as he said this, he looked around and quite miraculously, it was as if the fire understood what he was saying. It stopped in its tracks. And instead of devouring the forest, it was as if a torch had been plunged into a pool of water. The fire in that area just disappeared. This became so famous throughout the whole of India that after that it was known as the truth of the quail. And it's said that in that part of the forest there can never be a fire because the, the statement of what was right and what was true by one small bird who was stuck in his nest without his mother and his father could have so much power. So this is a lifetime when the Bodhisattva was perfecting truthfulness and truth. And it's said that if you say a true thing the world does listen. So we remember the quail and remember the power of truthfulness in our lives and perhaps in our meditation too. That's a wonderful resource, isn't it? And <clears throat> as well as the Jatakas, <clears throat> there are other collections of Buddhist stories for parents and children. <clears throat> which you might like to dip in and use in the same way. And it, as well as teaching stories, uh, the Jatakas and the Suttas, there's also personal teaching stories. Now these are stories that you write yourselves as the Samatha practitioners. As I said earlier, we're, we're all storytelling creatures. And I'd like to share an example of this. While I was browsing recently, I came across a personal story in a newsletter from the Manchester Centre for Buddhist Meditation and it's from the issue of September 2019. It was called A Journey to Another World and this used the format of a space exploration story to investigate various aspects of Dhamma including mindfulness of breathing, different stages of the meditation practice and the four dominant factors Party. And it immediately engaged me. And for me, it was just another example of how story can take you into the heart of investigation very quickly and easily. Now, as I said earlier, 
I was a storyteller long before I encountered Samata. I was, and I still am, a teller of myths and legends, of traditional and folk tales. It's fairly easy to see how teaching tales, specific teaching tales, can be used to investigate them. But however good these are, most of them concentrate on teaching a limited number of points. So they tend to be less nuanced, less complex than stories written for other purposes. So I was thinking of stories, and some of this will be familiar to you, stories such as the Greek myths, which examine the behaviour of humans and divinities, how they think and live and try to make sense of their worlds. I'm thinking of traditional stories which have been told in different versions all over the world, examining how their characters respond to their world. Stories of love and loss, of compassion, betrayal and forgiveness, testing, trials, trickery, stories of greed, hatred and delusion, stories trying to answer the question, who am I? All issues which we investigate as Buddhists. So on one level, I was starting to make links with my Dhamma study when I was storytelling, <clears throat> but I didn't pursue it until a teacher in one of my study groups showed me the way and introduced me to the possibility of working with non-teaching Buddhist stories. One evening, he surprised us at the beginning of our, our session <clears throat> by telling us the story of the magic flute, you know, from Mozart's opera in our group. And we were really surprised because this wasn't the usual way of starting a text study group. But then we explored the Dhamma implicit in the story. And this was so productive in terms of discussion. And what's more, from the beginning, it introduced an element of joyful investigation. And that persisted when we came to discuss the text, which was the focus of our evening's work. Beginning the story in this case was like an effective warm up, you know, like practicing scales before you play a piano piece, and it enhanced the quality of what we did after. But we all felt this, and so we introduced this for the remains of the study group. Every week, someone would bring a story, they would introduce it, they would talk about the point they'd taken out of the story, and then as a group, we would investigate it a warm-up before we went to study our bit. And for me, it was as if I was at last giving myself permission to explore the stories I know and love at different levels, at different deeper levels, and it complemented the work I was doing with Dharma. And I'd just like to say a few additional words about why I believe stories, not just teaching stories, are worthy of investigation. I keep saying humans are storytelling creatures. In listening to or telling stories, we're using a knowledge which we've practiced from our early years. Whatever our circumstances, whatever our culture, we've all been exposed to story in some form. And I'd like to quote the Nigerian author Ben Okri, who himself has a knowledge of Buddhism. There's nothing that expresses the roundness of the human being more than storytelling. The great stories which appear all over the world in different variations are intuitions sensed about the mysterious nature of absolute reality. Great stories have lightness and multidimensional agility. They speak constantly to the different levels in us. They speak to us at the level we are on. Stories are never just what they seem. So I'm going to suggest that you might wish to start looking at non-Buddhist stories, which are familiar to you in this light, investigating what teaching can be drawn from them. And I want to illustrate this by looking at just two stories. 
but in terms of the Four Noble Truths. But this is just a starting point to give you a flavour. The first one is the Odyssey, which is one of my favourites. You may have come across the Odyssey, a Greek epic story. In this, Odysseus, or Ulysses as he's known in the Romans, Roman kind of translation, he was compelled to spend 10 years fighting a war which was not of his making. And he was desperate to return to his wife and his son across the sea. So for me, this is the first noble truth. Life involves suffering. However, in addition to being a ruthless warrior, Theseus was known for his cleverness and cunning. He was so desperate to return home, he used any means possible to achieve this, including trickery and deceit, as well as fighting. He causes himself, as well as his men, much grief. To me, this is a second noble truth. Suffering is caused by attachments, aversions and attractions. The turning point comes when he meets Tiresias, a seer in the underworld, and though he doesn't realise it at the time. He's told, when you reach home, you must take an oar from your ship and walk inland till you reach a place where no one knows about the sea, where no one knows who you are. And to me, this is the third noble truth. There's the possibility of liberation from suffering. One abandons craving, hating, delusion. Of course, Odysseus doesn't recognise this advice at the time. And on his return home, he still hasn't abandoned his old warrior persona, his hubris. Even though the story apparently ends with him arriving home and greeting his wife and his son, he's still not at peace. He hasn't abandoned the hate, the desire, the sense of self. And this shows himself in the ruthless killing of his wife's suitors and the even more ruthless killing of the innocent maidservants. Eventually, he realises he has to take the advice and he sets off with an oar over his shoulder into the inland mountainous part of the island till he finds people who have no idea what the sea is and who he is. And only then can he abandon his previous identity as a hero, as a famous warrior. And this opens up the possibility of achieving peace and equanimity. And to me, that is the true end of the story. Perhaps the fourth noble truth. There is a way to freedom from desire, hate and delusion. And that's from an epic. It can be applied to simpler stories as well. There's a story of Pinocchio. Uh, the wooden puppet who had the nose that grew longer and longer as he told lies, which he did all the time. You can apply the Four Noble Truths to this. He's a naughty wooden marionette who gains wisdom through a series of misunderstandings which lead him to realising his dream. So in terms of the Four Noble Truths, the very fact of his birth represents suffering. In that he's not born as a real human boy as he wanted, but as a wooden puppet. In his life, he adds to his suffering. Through greed for adventure, money and pleasure, he shows hate in acts of disobedience and in rejecting his father, Geppetto. However, and here we come to the third truth, there is a way out of this suffering. A series of misadventures leads him to reassess his life and to change his ways. He recognises the way out and he starts to follow it. He goes to school to study. He finds his father again and he helps him. And then finally one night, he wakes up as a boy, a real boy at last, with his former puppet body lying lifeless on the floor. It's a story of metamorphosis and rebirth. A nibbana of sorts. And that's just one story. But ordinary fairy and folk tales are rich. 
because they were passed on orally, they spread all over the world. There are many variations, many incarnations. And I don't know if you know, one of the Jataka tales um, re-emerged as one of the Br'er Rabbit stories from the United States. If you've ever come across the Tar Baby, the origin of that is in a Jataka tale. Versions of traditional stories such as Cinderella are found all over the world. And the more we examine these stories, the more we can recognise the universal truths they deal with, the questions they try to answer, which are the questions we're working with in Buddhism. For instance, with Cinderella, we can look at her miserable situation, but we can also look at how she dealt with it, with patience and with compassion. We can look at her stepsister's behaviour, but also their feelings of insecurity and jealousy and craving. We can ex examine this story, for instance, in terms of the Brahma Viharas or some of the Paramis. The choice is up to us so we can bring to the story whatever we want. I spoke about some of this at the last Manchester Association AGM and I had the opportunity to try out some of these ideas and I'm very, very grateful to the participants for their willingness to be guinea pigs and some of them are here today, I know, so thank you. After my talk, I divided them into groups of three or so and got them to choose a folded up paper with the name of a traditional story or fairy tale on it and then to spend a few moments, a few minutes in groups, investigating the story in terms of Dhamma. And almost, almost without exception, the discussion was animated and enthusiastic, with some very interesting insights into the stories. However, I did come across one stumbling block. I chosen stories I assumed everyone knew, stories from my childhood. And I discovered that some people had forgotten these and needed reminding before they could complete the task. And this was a lesson for me. So if you as a teacher would like to try this with your group, read them the story first. In summary, Samatha is about investigation. I'm suggesting you might try, like to try investigating the Dhamma through stories, either alone or in a group. It can be done at any level, and you may be surprised what emerges. As one of the participants in the AGM said to me afterwards, when you first suggested it, I thought the idea of investigating Dhamma through these kinds of stories was bonkers. Now I'm going to use that approach again. You might think it's bonkers, but you won't know until you try. I was so uh, my question is really just about um so i was thinking about cinderella and and i'm interested in what you think ingrid the thing cinderella ends meeting the prince and being happy ever after <laughs> yeah. is that is that could you consider that as a delusion <laughs> <laughs> it could be that's what i mean it's all open to investigation and it's up to us which strands we want to take I mean, personally, yes. I'm quite interested in secondary characters in stories. You know, like yeah. this thing. So it's just yes. using the story as a vehicle for investigating yes. whatever yes. Happens, um, like, jumps out at us. Yes, yes. Yeah, there's, no, there's no kind of definitive answer. I know where, you, where you're coming from with the prince. And <laughs> I mean, you know, certainly the qualities of the patient endurance and the, you know, her, her sweet nature. Yes. Yeah. Uh, go back to kind of have a go with one and see what comes mm. out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. Good well, thought. Thank you, for, thank you for the question. Yeah. I'm looking. Oh, there you are, Mark. Can you unmute? Yes, I, I was at the AGM. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it wasn't last year, it was this year. Was it this year? <laughs> what a long year. <laughs> um, and I was doing the 
um, the group that did get the Cinderella story, as it turned out. <laughs> and I couldn't remember very much. I couldn't remember the detail of the story, but I did remember something of the story. And the bit that sort of leaped out at me when we were talking about it was the instant in the story where um, Cinderella's sisters try, each try to put their foot in the um, <laughs> flipper or uh, or two, yeah. Um, <clears throat> which uh, Cinderella left behind her from when running from the ball. Um, and that's um, sort of reminding me of occasions when um, you know, trying to do breathing mindfulness practice, of trying <laughs> to force things in. <laughs> <laughs> just doesn't work. Um, but the image of um, Cinderella's foot going into the, the slipper and fitting it perfectly just brought up a very quite um, distinct feeling of um, you know, times in the practice when there is that sort of harmony between mm. the mind and the breath, or the heart and the breath. And uh, that sort of did take me by surprise, that, that sort of particular image came up in that way. Well, thank you. It's a wonderful example of taking out of the story what you need to take out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what came to mind to me was a, sto a, a Chinese story, fairy story, that I think I might have told at the centre in a group as well. And it, it's a beautiful story. Um, they Somebody find this magic uh, barrel and um, whatever that falls into it, you know, fills up and fills up. And by chance, a gold coin uh, falls into it. So it starts filling up and overflowing with gold. And they start shoveling it out. But of course, they get tired and they set their old elderly grandfather, <laughs> you know what's coming, to get the gold out there. They go off and enjoy themselves and leave him doing all the shoveling. And of course, he dies. <laughs> falls into the barrel and then they have to spend all the money burying these masses of grandmas that keep going <laughs> after the barrel and it you know again there's all sorts of things you can bring to mind for that in terms of you know greed and compassion kindness and lots of other things I mean they just I just think stories are, are wonderful and I've noticed also we, even in study groups often people bring a story, even if it's their life story or something part of anything they're talking about they've done for the week or something, often it's like a story. You bring it to the group and you're sharing part of yourself in these stories as well. Mm -hmm. So I think they're very powerful. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, thank you. And I remember that story. Because <laughs> yeah. right. what was um, coming up for me was um, I had a, a dream recently and I it just brought to mind that a dream can be uh, a, a material for, for study as well because this dream was so clear to me what it was actually teaching me it was it was um, and it's still with me and it's and I just wanted to say that dreams can also be used for a study group mm. yes yeah exactly it's another form of story yeah thank you that was really I'm, I'm gonna really give that a go can you can you hear me yes yeah. 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 brilliant yeah <laughs> that was really interesting Ingrid um I did recently um do some poetry with with the with with the Manchester you know the there's a Manchester Facebook um and it encourages people who not necessarily um meditate who are during these times um, it's something that Valerie set up and at with Anne and I've done I've done one of those meditation sessions so it's people from the community not just Manchester mm. yeah and that was lovely and, and um, I tried some poetry and um, it has a similar effect I think because it, it it's sort of, you know it's very creative way of uh, re you know thinking about connecting um and and i think that what you know um this morning it's made me think well i'll try maybe try a story next time with people who don't um, <coughs> meditate um you know we're not part of samata um as a way in um because i find it that was really good showing that you can use tales that <coughs> we're all familiar with so thank you <laughs> well thank you for that idea
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just showing that story, yeah. what you make it and how you use yeah. it is your decision and there's no set answer or yeah. set way of doing anything. Yeah, I was just thinking recently, we've been doing some work on the Abhidhamma <laughs> and we're looking particularly at the elements and there's some lovely notes in the, to the Abhidhamma about the elements and how illusory they are, mm. almost like a magician who is mm. something that looks true but it isn't. And immediately came to mind lots of stories. Oh yeah, like the the queen <laughs> who wants to be the fairest of them all and is constantly looking in the mirror, but is really very corrupt and very mean and is is out to kill our uh, is it Snow White? Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. and um, Snow White mm -hmm. who is just um, trying to be a good person. Mm -hmm. um, of course, that, that, wins out in the end. The other thing that came to me very strongly when I was thinking about that illusory nature from stories was the candy house in Hansel and Gretel, how they're wandering in the woods mm. and the wicked witch which lures them in with this house made of candy. Yes. Yes. Um, so and you know it's about sense desire isn't it and how mm -hmm. our illusions and what we're seeing and how we grasp onto them and we want them are actually leading us astray quite often um and it's a kind mm -hmm. of cautionary tale they're cautionary tales aren't they yeah mm -hmm. i mean a lot of them were written as cautionary tales yes mm -hmm. and they've kind of become embroidered and developed their own life yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, I started teaching not long ago, and just uh, all the newcomers are, you know, interested in meditation to start with. But I was thinking to introduce a bit of Dharma teaching. But, you know, using a sutra to start with is quite formal, and then it's not connecting with the feelings and so on. So using uh, that stories um, the, as a method, mm. it's something it's really connect with the people's feelings straight away. Mm. And if it's a famous stories or something, it's people knows mm. and, and that's why you can investigate gradually. Mm. And uh, it's a really good way, you know, that, um, mm it could be a poem or something or cute people can bring their own stories or mm. something so that the, the people can also participate as well mm. and, uh, so give me a really good idea thank you very much <laughs> it's good because it's very non-threatening if you approach yes. your own feelings through a story mm. Mm. it helps people to feel more confident about expressing what they're feeling mm. Mm. But they can do it through the story. This is why we use picture books for children. They mm. work with some very deep and serious themes mm. and through stories of toy animals and teddy bears to investigate very deep, mm. strong mm. emotional feelings. For the yes. same reason, it makes it safe. Mm. Mm. Thank so you. Good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to finish the session with um a storytelling farewell ritual and then the blessing that's okay sometimes we sometimes doing storytelling is finished with three apples and depending on the audience take one apple and either throw it to the audience behind us or carefully place it behind us and this is giving thanks to all the storytellers of the past, everyone who's told stories in the past and given us the stories we use today. Then we take the second apple and throw or pass it to someone in the audience, the listeners. Often we choose the youngest person. And this is giving thanks to the storytellers of the future because all listeners potential storytellers for the future and this is how stories are passed on. 
but the third apple we keep for ourselves and we eat it enjoying the present and the privilege of having been able to tell a story in the present in the here and now so i think this has some resonances with what we do in our practice when we pay homage to acknowledge our lineage acknowledge the dhamma and the sangha so i'd like to finish with a blessing now i'll read the blessing Bawatu Saba Mangalam, Lakantu Saba Dewata, Saba Buddha, Nuha, Sada Soti, Bawantu Te, Bawantu Saba Mangalam, Lakantu Saba Dewata, Saba Nudama, Nuha, Sada Soti, Bawantu Te. Bawan to Saba Mangalang, Rakan to Saba Sayuata, Baba Sangha, Nina Sada Soti, Bawan to Te. Thank you.